Welcome to our first principles class in preparation for baptism and the story of the Bible. Uh, this is lesson number three. And you might remember that in our last lesson, lesson number two, that we looked at the creation and each of those days culminating in the creation of Adam and Eve and the amazing promise that God had made to them by giving them everything that he had made and, and offering it to them to have rulership and dominion over this amazing planet that he'd created. But it was all predicated, it was all based on the fact that they had to obey. And so God left them with a choice to obey and live or to disobey and die. And we talked about how that, that is still the same choice that is God is offering to mankind and to humanity today. And so he says to us today, he says, if you obey me, you'll live. If you disobey me, you'll die. And so the choices remain the same. Well, we know when we come to this uh, section of our Bible into Genesis chapter 3, just before we start that, we want to look at what the last verse of Genesis chapter 1, and you might remember how I said that Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 are like the same chapter. There's information in chapter 1, and then more information is given in chapter 2. So it's like the end of Genesis chapter 1 and the end of Genesis chapter 2 are the same ending. And so God ends Genesis chapter 1 by saying that everything he made was very good. So everything God made in those six days of creation was very good. So we think about the light that he made. It was very good. The firmament that he made, that space that he made between the, 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 the earth and between the, the sky, that was very good. We, we, we think about the way that God separated the, the earth from the waters and created countries and land and oceans and rivers. That was very good. The sun and the moon, the seasons that he created, that was very good. The fields, the fields with all of its, 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 its different food that was growing, that was all very good. On, on day five, when he created the birds and the fish, that was very good. On day six, when he created everything that creeps upon the face of the earth, the, the, the spiders and the ants and the cockroaches and the spiders and the snakes, all those creepy, crawly things, they were very good. The animals, the cows, the sheep, the lions, the elephants, the giraffes, it was all very good. And Adam and Eve that he created, they were very good. And so when we open up in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, the, the story changes because it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. And we need to read carefully here what's being said. Because just in that last verse of chapter 1, we read that everything God made, including, yep, including the serpent, including the snake. I don't like snakes. I don't like spiders. But when God made the spiders and the snakes, they were part of his very good creation. So when God speaks about this snake here, it's a part of his very good creation. But we also must remember the lesson that when God created the animals, the female he made from the dirt, the male he made from the dirt, he made them both from two separate piles of dirt, but they were made with no moral, no moral compass, no moral ability. The animals, the cows, the sheep, the dogs, the goats, the lions, the elephants, the snakes, the spiders, they had no morality about them. They did not understand the difference between right and wrong. And we, we spoke about that at length last class. And so now we're introduced to a snake that has no morality about it. It's an amoral creature. And this amoral creature, this amoral serpent or snake, we're told that it was more subtle in some Bibles. In your Bible it might be the word more crafty. Okay? So, so this animal, this snake is more subtle or more crafty, more clever than the other animals. 
And we know that when we see certain animals, that some animals are, are more clever, you know, more sneaky than, than other animals. And in this particular case, God is going to use that ability in this snake to test Adam and Eve. Remember what God wants. God wants obedience. That's what he wants. And so here comes a test. And we, we must understand this. And, and, and we read this in, in Deuteronomy. We read that when the children of Israel were about to go into the promised land, after they'd come out of Egypt, after they'd come out of slavery, after they'd passed through the Red Sea, which was like a type of baptism, and now they stood ready to go through the wilderness to the promised land, to a land that God had promised them. And God says, I'm going to send you through this wilderness to test you, to prove you, because he wanted to know. He says this in Deuteronomy. He says, I want to know where your heart is. Is your heart with me or isn't it? And that's the only way that God, you know, will, 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 will understand where our heart is by testing us. And so now he's going to test Adam and Eve. And he, he, he has this, this snake and it says, now the snake was more subtle or more crafty than any beast which God had made. And the snake said to the woman, has God said ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So the snake asked the question, hasn't God said that you can eat of everything in the garden? And in verse two, the woman says, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But in verse three, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, the tree that is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you even touch it. So there's a little bit more information. You know, often in, 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 in the first chapter, we think, oh, they're not allowed to eat it. But, but here's some more information. They're not allowed to even touch it. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. And he says, and she says that if, if we touch it, or if we eat it, we'll die. And in verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, you won't die. So here's the contradiction. The snake says to the woman, has God said that you can eat of everything? And the woman said, yes. He said, we can eat of everything except one tree. The one in the middle, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God has told Adam and I that we're not to eat of it. We're not allowed to even touch it. Because if we touch it or eat it, we're going to die. And the snake says, no, you won't. And he goes on in verse 5. And here comes the temptation. God knows that in the day that you eat thereof, your eyes will be open and you'll be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and she ate. And she gave unto her husband and he ate also. So we, we have to go through this carefully and read carefully and read slowly and see just what happens in this story. The proposition from the snake is put to Eve that God has given you permission to eat of everything. And Eve says, almost everything, just not that one tree. And she tells the truth. That's the truth. God said, yes, you can eat of all these trees but you can't eat of that one. And God had told Eve, and Eve told the snake, if we eat of that one, even if we touch it, we're going to die. And the snake says, no you won't. In fact, God is hiding something from you. God is not telling you the whole story. Because if you eat of that fruit, you are going to be like gods. Now why did the snake say that? What's happening in the story for the snake to see that? Because remember, 
The snake is an amoral creature. It doesn't know the difference between right and wrong. All it is, is it's more crafty. It, it has the power to reason, but not be moral. And there's a difference. And so what the snake, which is able to communicate at this point of time, what the snake was able to do, the snake was able to look around and think to itself, wow, look at this. This garden is amazing. And there's Adam and Eve over there. Wow, look at them. And over here at different times are the angels. And they're amazing too. And they're God's messages. And they're sort of like God. And so the, 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 the snake, as it's thinking about these things, is thinking, well, I guess if, if they eat of this tree, then they'll just be like that. They'll be just like the angels if they eat of that tree, sort of like, like God's. And so the, the, the snake, with no morality, not understanding the difference between right and wrong, simply says, Adam and Eve plus some fruit equals being like the angels or being like God's. But it's still told a lie because what the snake did was the snake contradicted the message that God had given Adam and Eve. God had given a clear message to Adam and Eve. And the snake, because it was amoral, was not able to comprehend that. So now the lot falls to Eve as to what you are going to do with this contrasting information. And Eve had the word of God on one side, and she had the word of the snake or the serpent on the other side. And now she's going to decide which one she's going to follow, which one she's going to agree with, which one she's going to obey. And what happens is it says in verse 6 that when the woman saw that the tree was good. See, look what happens here. There's three steps here. She's going to look, look, look. She's going to look, look, look at this fruit. And as she's looking, she's thinking. And it's pleasant to the eyes. It's an attractive thing. It's attractive to the eyes. And it's one to make one look clever, look intelligent. It's a fruit to make one wise. Now, how do we relate to that today? Well, in, in my experience, I can use a classic example. I don't know if any of you women out there have gone through this experience. But this is my experience. When a woman is going through a shopping mall with her partner, with her husband, with her boyfriend, you'll often see the husband and the partner walking together. They have a purpose, and the purpose is to perhaps go and do the grocery shopping. But as they're walking, through the mall, they start passing clothing stores, handbag stores, dress stores. And what inevitably happens sometimes is that as they're walking hand in hand, all of a sudden the hand chain breaks loose and the husband, he keeps walking towards the grocery store and he takes five or six or seven paces and he stops and turns around and his wife has stopped at the the, the window of a dress store and she's looking at a dress in the window and she's looking, looking, looking at this dress. And the husband knows or the partner knows, Eesh, if she goes into this store, I know what's going to happen. And so she calls the husband and says, look, 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 look. And the husband goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go and get the groceries. Let's go. She said, no, 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 I'm just looking. I'm just looking. Nothing wrong with looking. Doesn't cost anything to look. I'm just looking. And so she looks and she looks. And then she says, look, let's just go in. I just want to, I just want to feel what, it, what the fabric feels like. So in she goes and she starts feeling the fabric. She picks the dress up and, and puts it in front of herself and says to her partner, how do I look? It's, you know, it's now pleasant to the eyes. Do, do I look good in this? Do you think I would look good in this? What's the partner going to say? 
No, you don't. He's got to say, yes, of course, you're going to look beautiful in it. But, you know, let's go and get the groceries because we can't afford this dress. She says, let me just try it on. I'm not buying. I'm not buying. I just want to try it on. And so she goes into the change room, puts the dress on. And now she says, don't I look sharp in this dress? And she, she does a little twirl, throws her arms around her partner, says, don't I look beautiful in this dress? You see the process? And eventually she says, it's just one. And look, it's on sale. We're actually going to save money by buying this dress. It's got 20% discount. I'm saving you money. I'm saving you 20% by buying it on sale. And so the process where they were on their way to the grocery store, but stopping and looking is the start of the process to end up and the Bible describes these three steps as the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. They are the three steps to sin. Lust of the eyes, look, look, look. The lust of the flesh, pleasant to the eyes. And the pride of life, something to make you look somebody who you are not. And so... Adam and Eve sin and they take of the fruit and they eat it and as soon as they take of the fruit their eyes are open they know that they're now naked you know before they were like little two or three year old kids who run around naked and play and they don't think anything about being naked but when they grow up and when they get especially when they get into their early teens you try walking into your daughter's bedroom when she's 11 12 13 there's suddenly shrieks and squeals and, you know, I'm getting dressed. And, 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 and they're very aware and very conscious of their nakedness. And so Adam and Eve are now aware of their nakedness. And so what they do is they cover themselves with fig leaves and they hide in the garden when they hear the angels. And what happens is the process of the blame game starts. The blame game starts. And what we read is we read in Genesis chapter 3. And it says that in verse 9, that the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where are you? And he said, I heard your voice and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. It's almost like they gave themselves up. So the angel says, Well, how do you know you're naked? Like yesterday you didn't know you were naked. How do you know you're naked today? What's What's happened? Have you eaten of that tree that you weren't supposed to? And immediately what happens is the man blames the woman. And the woman blames the snake. But they don't just blame the woman and the snake. Look at it says. He says, the man said in verse 12, the woman whom you gave to me, she gave me the tree and I ate. In other words, God, that woman that you made, that woman that you made, God, she made me do it. It's your fault and it's her fault, not my fault. So the angel turns to Eve and he says to the woman, what have you done? And the woman said, the serpent, the snake that you made, you made the snake, that snake that you made, it tricked me. It tricked me. So, you know, really, it's, it's your fault and it's the snake's fault, not my fault. But the snake's an amoral creature. It's amoral. So, God or the angel doesn't ask the snake why did you do it because it has no idea about immorality about sin about right and about wrong and so what God does is God proceeds to give a sentence of condemnation to the snake and then he's going to do something quite amazing and we're going to look at that in our next class next time
So until we meet again, bye for now. God bless. God be with you. Talk with you soon. Bye for now.